Hi, I'm Dr. Justin Essery, and in this video we're going to be learning about kernel regularized least squares. Kernel regularized least squares is a technique that was uh, developed by Jens Heinmuller and Chad Hazlett. You can see the title of their political analysis uh, paper uh, listed right here. And um, essentially what the KRLS framework does is try to uh, in some way bridge the gap between linear regression and non-parametric uh, kernel regression in a way that's going to give us the uh, benefits of flexibility uh, while avoiding the costs of the curse of dimensionality. It's uh, a cousin of many other um, non-parametric methods like uh, the lasso, which uh, we don't talk about in this class. Um, but the KRLS estimator um, should give you a bit of a, a, a feel for how these methods work. Uh, and it comes with a very nice R package uh, that allows you to implement the KRLS technique in real data pretty quickly. So uh, let's talk about how uh, KRLS works and how it relates to um, uh, non-parametric regression and ordinary least squares. All right, so um, let's uh, start off by thinking about the uh, regular uh, uh, ordinary least squares regression model. So Think about the standard linear model here. And in a standard linear model, you've got a dependent variable that's going to be uh, an additive linear function of a bunch of independent variables, x sub k, and an error term. Uh, or if you want to write this in, in matrix notation, this would be y equals x beta plus epsilon. And what you're going to be doing is trying to estimate this beta component. And the OLS uh, solution for that is beta hat equals x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Right. So that's a relatively uh, a basic idea, uh, probably one that you've seen before many, many times. Um, and what it relates to is the idea of You've got a axis with a bunch of data points. A line is a good description uh, for, for what you're doing, uh, for what's going on in this data, rather. And so if we're modeling y is a function of 1x component, uh, we can just kind of look at this and see, well, it's probably pretty safe to draw a line in here. That's a pretty good description of what's going on. So, you know, line is good. <laughs> um, we, uh, OLS assumes that that linear structure is there. It has to be there in order to, to make sense. Um, KRLS is built on a, a different assumption. Uh, the assumption of OLS is that the observations are linear related. The KRLS estimator is built on the assumptions are on the assumption that uh, observations that are close to one another in the space of the independent variables are also going to be similar to one another in the space of dependent variables. And you may recognize that assumption. It's a familiar one if you've studied kernel regression. So if you remember back to when we studied kernel regression, depending on the order in which you're watching these videos, <laughs> there is a video on kernel regression. Uh, in the very simplest uh, degree zero Nadaria Watson estimator, so let's think about a degree zero, aka Nadaria Watson estimator. Uh, what we do is we say that the fitted value of y for a, at a particular point um, is uh, a function of the values of y for observations that are near the point in question. So there's this kernel function. And it forms a weight as part of a weighted average. So this is the weight of a particular point i in relationship to the target point o. This is the value of y at the particular point i. Uh, 
and we're just constructing a weighted average of the data set weighted by this kernel function. Uh, the denominator here is just normalizing by the, 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 the sum of the kernels, the sum of the kernel weights. So it's a weighted average. And visually what this looks like is you, whoops, you've got, let's, let's do blue, I like blue. So, uh, here we go, bam. Okay, so, uh, again, we've got X and Y. And Nadariah Watson is um, typically something you're going to think about using when you can't safely assume a linear structure. But you can assume that uh, the value of y at some target point is going to be close to the value of uh, y's for x's that are close to the target point. So let me sort of give you a visual of what I mean here in case you haven't studied not a Raya Watson regression. So imagine we want to predict y at this point. Okay, so this is our target point, x0. We want to predict y at this point. Well, uh, a line is obviously not a good description for what's going on in this data, but we may be able to assume that the target or prediction point y hat, um, th the value of y hat should be um, a, a value of y that sort of shares a lot of similarity with the y values that are close by in x space. So for example, whatever y <coughs> we're going to predict here, it's going to share commonalities with, you know, this value and and this value and this value and this value uh, much more so than let's say that value which is far away in x space. So um, what not Araya Watson regression does is it just uh, creates a weight um, often that weight is uh, a sort of a Gaussian normal. It's not the only choice, but that's a choice. And um, we just construct a weighted average of all the y values um, as shown in this little uh, uh, equation here, where the kernel weights are given by proximity to the target point x0 in, in uh, x space. So points that are really close, that are really high in this kernel weight get a lot of weight, uh, points that are far away, and you can there's an imaginary sort of um, abscissa here, uh, get very little weight. So the weighted average is probably going to look something like this. It's going to be sort of close to the values near it, and we would say that's the y hat at that particular point. And if we just moved that kernel uh, the, the, uh, along, slid it along the x-axis, and calculated a y hat zero for all the points there, that point would sort of slide along with the data and hopefully it would follow the curves in the data. Okay, so that's the Nadariah Watson uh, uh, estimator. Um, and it has a, uh, an obvious, several disadvantages, but one obvious disadvantage is um, the so-called curse of dimensionality. Uh, as the number of dimensions that you're interested in studying, the number of x's, starts to increase, the data just becomes very, very sparse. It becomes hard to get any sort of reliable prediction. Uh, eventually, you just essentially never have enough data to fill the space. You can't fill all the hypercubes that are in that space you've created. So KRLS, the, the objective here is to try to interpolate. That's probably the wrong word, but it's to, it's to manage the trade-off here in, a, in an advantageous way. So uh, here's what KL KRLS does. So uh, KRLS uses uh, two weights. Uh, one is a constant uh, item coefficient weight. Mm -hmm. And two is the uh, kernel uh, proximity weight or distance weight. So in KRLS, the fitted value of y at a particular point zero is uh, just as before, it's a, it's a sum. It's an average in some ways. It's an average of these item coefficients uh, there's one item coefficient per observation in the data, and uh, we multiply that by a kernel uh, distance weight, k, x0, xi. Uh, 
just like before, this is just a a a, a, a this is a, a kernel weight that gives greater um, density to observations that are uh, closer to x zero and weights observations that are further away less. And you can write that in matrix form as y equals k cap k c, where in this case uh, cap k is going to be an n. Whoops, uh, I messed that up. That's going to be an n by n matrix, and this c is going to be a vector n by one. So y hat is going to be n by one, which makes sense. We want to make one prediction for every observation in the data set. All right. So um, what's the advantage that this procedure has over uh, the Nye-Rye Watson nonparametric estimator? Well, it's a lot computationally. Uh, it's a lot simpler computationally to actually figure out what y hat is here. So the k matrix, the n by k k matrix of kernel weights, is uh, it only needs to be computed once, right? So given some kernel function, like the Gaussian or whatever it might be, this is a function of two points x zero and x i. All you need to do is compute that once for every pair of points, right? So um, actually, I just realized this is a mistake. This is actually an n by n matrix. So if you look at the individual entries in, in, cap, in the cap K matrix, you can think of there being rows corresponding to all the observations, x3 all the way down to xn, and then rows here, x1, x2, x3, blah, 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 all the way to xn. You can compute entries for this K matrix that correspond to each possible pairing of points. And you only need to compute them once, right? So you basically have to compute n squared many entries in that uh, matrix. And uh, typically, these kernel weights are going to be um, just Euclidean distances uh, between any two points in the space, right? x0 and xi. Uh, then, once this is fixed, um, when you go to actually figure out what uh, what the y hat is, all you need to do is compute c hat. You need to fit c hat for in this equation. And this problem is analogous to the problem of fitting y hats with ordinary least squares regression by taking an n by k x matrix and a k by one beta hat matrix and fitting beta hat uh, using ordinary least squares. You can um, compute c hat, the fitted c values, using least squares. So what we've done is we've, uh, or what Hazlett and Heinmuller have done, is changed a, a relatively complicated Nadaria Watson estimator that involves a bunch of different um, local averages and change it into a relatively simple um, ordinary least squares type of problem that relies on this n by n um, distance matrix has oops has um, n squared many elements uh, and then once that's fixed it only needs to be computed once it doesn't have to compute it over and over again so the advantage is uh, you get the flexibility of a Nadaria Watson estimator um, because these C hats, these fitted C hat uh, values, can allow the space in question to take a, a lot of different forms. The, the fitted, uh, the, I should say the space, can allow the fitted surface to take a lot of different forms, uh, not just linear forms, but the uh, computational element, you, your, the computational process you use to get those forms is relatively straightforward and easy for a modern computer uh, to uh, to do. So in, in essence, um, it, like we sort of promised at the beginning, it's a trade-off between the complexity uh, of a Nadaria Watson estimator and the simplicity of an ordinary least squares estimator. You get some of the benefits, many of the benefits of uh, a flexibility that the non-parametric estimators offer you uh, with uh, substantial gains in um, uh, computational ease and also in solving the 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 the, the curse of dimensionality problem that plagues uh, 
nonparametric estimators. One problem faced by the KRLS estimator uh, and other nonparametric estimators like the Nadaraya Watson is the possibility of overfitting. So to sort of look at what an example of that might look like, imagine we have a data set with a generally U-shaped pattern, something like that. And um, we can tell visually that the best fit for this might be something like this. That's a pretty crude approximation, but whatever. Um, if you use a Nadaraya Wata, Watson estimator with a very, very short bandwidth, or slim bandwidth, or um, KRLS with no regularization step, and we'll talk about regularization in just a second, um, you might get an answer uh, from one of these procedures that looks like this, <laughs> or a smooth version of this, uh, a fit, uh, a, fitted, a fitted surface that just connects every dot. And uh, while the in-sample fit properties of that uh, procedure are amazing, uh, probably uh, the out-of-sample fit uh, uh, properties of that procedure are not so amazing. So you can imagine what will happen if we start uh, drawing new uh, points out of the um, underlying data generating process, including some noise. And what we would expect is that the uh, distance between the uh, the real, the sort of best fitted surface, the blue surface, uh, and those new data points is going to be a lot smaller than the distance between the sort of weird red jagged surface and the fitted data points. So you can see the distance between here and here is a lot shorter than the distance between here and here, for example. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is um, KRLS or the Nadaraya Watson without some sort of procedure to smooth or regularize the fitting it just connects dots without sort of recognizing that there's a noise component of the process. Uh, overfitting is undesirable because it's out of sample forecasting properties are generally not as good. So what do they do about this? Well, what they do is they add uh, a penalty for the complexity of the space uh, that, um, uh, they, I should say, the complexity of the surface uh, that is chosen uh, as part of the careless fitting procedure. So a uh, typical ordinary least squares problem uh, looks like this. You uh, choose, I should actually change this. You choose beta hat to minimize the sum of squared errors, right? Choose y hat to minimize the sum of squared errors, which for a linear regression, you know, is equivalent to right squared. Oh, I forgot the sum. Let's get that in there. Arg min the argument is beta hat sum i in one two n right. So um, if you turn KRLS loose on that, it's going to give you one of those weird overfitted points. So instead of doing that, why don't we add a complexity penalty to this, um, this basic sort of least square surface that causes the fit procedure to move away from overfitting to smooth the surface a little bit. So uh, to this sort of basic problem, actually I would say this basic problem, this is for OLS only, this is more appropriate to care or less. Uh, why don't we add um, this? And uh, what is this? Okay, so first of all, this notation uh, just means the sum from i in one to n of, uh, this should be y hat, you should all be hatted, y i squared. Uh, what that means is just the sum of squared fitted values, right? So it's a measure of the sort of the variance in Y that is created by the fitting process. If KRLS fits an exact straight line, uh, so in other words, a perfectly flat, non-sloped surface, um, this is going to be zero. 
And that's because as part of uh, the Keralis fitting process, data um, like Y and all, all the X values are pre-processed. So um, before you get started with the Keralis fit, um, you uh, take the sort of the raw Y, you subtract the mean, you divide by the standard deviation, and that gives you the sort of processed Y values on which Keralis operates. So if you look at those standardized values of Y, if Keralis just fits a, a, a sort of a mean line essentially, the mean is zero and hence the sum of squared uh, uh, deviations here is gonna be zero. What this means is the more sort of variation from the mean that you get as a part of Keralis, the more complicated the surface is and the greater this, we'll call this the complexity penalty, becomes. This is the complexity penalty right here. You'll notice that the, uh, the sum of squared deviations from the mean of the fitted values is only one component of the complexity penalty. There's also this lambda thing, uh, this so-called regularization parameter. If that lambda is zero, then you're gonna get the overfitted surface that we mentioned before, right? It's basically gonna not penalize complexity at all, and our Keralis is gonna connect the dots. The larger that lambda becomes, the more that Keralis will want to uh, will want to avoid um, uh, sort of connecting all the dots. And if lambda were to become really huge, um, it would be it would basically dominate the uh, the other component of the minimization uh, function. And so Keralis would just be forced to just fit a mean, fit a flat line. So just to make this totally clear, the uh, the the Keralis problem, is to choose y hat values, fitted values, to minimize the sum. My penmanship is not as good as it used to be. Uh, y hat i, a function of the x value of i, minus the observed value of y squared plus this complexity penalty. So if lambda were zero and this regularization bit of it, this complexity penalty were gone, we would just be stuck with the least squares problem. We'd have overfitted uh, uh, estimates and we'd have the sort of problem we described above. Um, if this, uh, 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 as this complexity pr penalty becomes larger, uh, care or less is, uh, it becomes sort of forced to create a smoother surface and then if lambda is gigantic, then you get a surface so smooth that it's perfectly flat. It's just gonna predict the mean y. Um, you've probably ought have already thought of the obvious question suggested by this process, which is uh, how do you decide what the best value of lambda should be? Um, well, okay, so uh, what we could do is we could apply a, a familiar non-parametric process of um, cross-validation. So cross-validation says um, fit a some sort of model um, n many times, leave one observation out every single time, uh, use that fit to predict the value of the dependent variable that you left out for that observation you left out, and then sum up all those values and you get this sort of cross-validation error. Uh, and then repeat that process, choose, you know, altering lambda a little bit every time until you find a lambda value that minimizes the cross-validation error. That would work. Um, it's very computationally expensive because you have to fit n minus one, or I'm sorry, you have to fit n uh, many models for every step of the cross-validation minimization and cross-validation error minimization process and so you're running hundreds or thousands of models just to pick this parameter lambda so uh, cross-validation uh, good idea uh, but very computationally expensive
So uh, it's a, it's a, actually, maybe it's a good thought, but a bad idea. It, it's just not gonna be a practical solution. So instead of doing um, cross-validation computationally, what we're gonna do is use a, an approximation, a formula approximation, which is the same thing we did uh, for kernelized, uh, kernel, uh, I'm sorry, for kernel regression uh, when computing the generalized cross-validation statistic, if that uh, rings a bell. So we're gonna use this um, statistic C over diagonal of the G to the minus one matrix. Uh, whoops, sorry, doing this backwards. Uh, let me erase this real quick. Uh, where uh, G equals K plus lambda I. So K is an N by N matrix. Lambda is the cross file or this uh, complexity penalty. I is the identity matrix, also N by N. Uh, so G is, this is a scalar here, so this is a scalar, so a one by one. Uh, so that means G is an M by N matrix. We're going to take the diagonal of the inverse of that matrix. Um, C is the fitted complex, uh, the fitted value for uh, the fitted um, uh, uh, choice parameter for each uh, point. And if we sum these up, we get a uh, leave one out error estimate, a cross-validation estimate. And we're going to choose lambda to minimize uh, this quantity. So maybe we can do this here. Um, well, no, that's not right. Well, I guess it's not totally wrong, but it's a little misleading. This is a, this, come on you, erase. Ah. This is a vector of length n. The sum of that vector is the leave one out error statistic. And then we choose our complexity penalty uh, parameter to, or complexity parameter, uh, regularization parameter to minimize that quantity, that estimate of um, that estimate of the um, cross-validation error. So um, that's that is Kerala's uh, in a in a nutshell. Um, you um, you fit Kerala's. Uh, you fit these C statistic or these uh, C parameters for um, for each point um, weighted by a matrix of uh, kernel density weights um, that the sum of squared errors between y hat and lambda is uh, penalized by a penalty parameter and uh, by a complexity uh, a complexity um, penalty which is weight itself weighted by this lambda um, penalty parameter here and you choose the parameter uh, so as to minimize this statistic which is sort of itself a function of the fitted C values. So you're going to uh, choose, there's gonna be a sort of a, a bunch of different choices of C hat, one corresponding to each one of the lambda values that you could possibly choose. You're gonna choose the C hat and the associated lambda um, that minimizes this estimate of the leave one out error statistic. So when you run a Keralas model in, in R, which we'll do in just a few minutes, um, that's that's what you're doing, you're, you're sort of using that process to come up with fitted values of C hat um, that, are, um, that are associated with a lambda that, that minimizes the leave one out error statistic. Before we talk about how to practically apply KRLS and uh, get meaningful quantities out of it and compute standard errors, uh, let's see an example uh, borrowed from the uh, Heinmuller and Hazlett appendix a visual example of, of how Keralus really works. Uh, so we've got some code here that produces uh, some plots. Uh, each one of these dark points corresponds to a point in X space. These are data points. And um, the data points uh, in, you see here are all at zero because they, the, the C's that correspond to these points have not been picked yet. 
Uh, but floating above each one of them is uh, a Gaussian distribution, a, a sort of unscaled. It's called unscaled because the C has not been multiplied by this distribution yet. These are the kernel weightings that go over each one of the data points in the space. So once these Gaussians are multiplied by their uh, scaling factor by C, uh, they then become, sort of they can go in different directions, some of the C's are negative, some of the C's are positive, um, and they add up to form the overall fit in the space. So this dark line here is the superposition, or just really the sum, of all of the Gaussian distributions at each one of these points, and also everywhere in between. So for example, this point in the line that I'm highlighting, I'm hovering over right now, is the sum of all four of these superposed Gaussians. The point of this demonstration is to illustrate how the KRLS process can produce very, very complicated uh, spaces, uh, surfaces, fitted surfaces, uh, from a relatively simple process. Now, if you look up here, the actual data generating process, that's it right there, is just, this is just a line, right? These four points are all in a line. And what Carolus is doing is it's getting pretty close to the line, not quite as well at the edges, right? As you go outside the convex hull of the space, um, but doing pretty a pretty good job of approximating this. But that's an easy problem, right? That's just a line. The idea is that as the spaces, as the, um, the data generating processes get more complicated and, and also exist in more dimensions of X, um, KRLS will do a good job of approximating that hidden surface, uh, that unknown surface, I should say, by superposition of a lot of different scaled Gaussians. And so by adding up a bunch of scaled C values, you can actually get a pretty complex uh, underlying space. So that's just a little insight into how KRLS actually works. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about how um, we compute effects of interest out of a... Um, out of a KRLS fit. So um, what I have here, these are three formulas uh, from the uh, Heinmuller and Hazlett paper. Uh, this first formula here is the uh, derived formula for a partial derivative uh, for the marginal effect of a variable x sub d uh, at a single observation j. So um, what this represents is just the derivative, partial derivative of y hat with respect to that particular variable. And recall that y hat in this case is equal to kc, right, where k is the uh, weight matrix, uh, c is the um, vector of fitted values. So for a single, um, for a single observation, this leads to a single value, right? It's the sum of k, the weights, uh, a vector of k weights, rather, and c, uh, the uh, vec or, uh, the vector of uh, fitted C statistics. So K times C is, is going to form an N by 1 vector, and then you're going to sum all those up to get the, the, to get the prediction. So the derivative is, uh, of that prediction is also a sum. Uh, and what you can see here is this is the kernel weight sort of reappearing itself. Uh, uh, re you know, it reappears um, in, the, in the function of the derivative. But the, the point of illustrating this is that the derivative is just like the surface itself, a sum. And you have to sum over all of the points in the data set to figure out the prediction at a point, um, at a particular point x sub, uh, x sub j in x, sub, in x space. And you're gonna have to do the same thing for a derivative. So um, one sort of quantity that, that might be of interest, rather than trying to look across the entire space at all these different partial derivatives, which we're going to do, but it, you can summarize that information with an expected partial derivative, and that's the second expression here. Uh, the expectation is taken over all the observations in the data set. So think about this for a second. The derivative for any single observation requires summing over the entire set of observations, all the different sort of kernel-weighted Cs in the data set. Then you're going to take that sum and you're going to sort of sum again over all the possible points at which you could predict, right? All the particular values in the data set. So this is where this double sum comes from, right? So what you're doing is you're averaging uh, what's the average partial derivative. Uh, when you take all the partial derivatives at every point in the set, what's the overall average? So this gives you some sort of summary sense of um, 
how much on average uh, a, 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 a small change in, in X or X sub, uh, X sub D um, causes a change in Y averaged over all the points in the data set. That's, that's the idea here. Um, oh. uh, so uh, that's, that's well and good for um, continuous X variables. But not all X variables are continuous, some are binary. And when they're binary, uh, a derivative doesn't make sense because the function only exists uh, at zero and one. Uh, so um, for binary variables, you replace this derivative with a first difference. You're taking the Y hat, add the binary variable equals one, all other variables set to, their, to whatever value they are. Uh, and you're uh, comparing that to Y hat when the binary variable is set to zero and all other variables are sort of at their, at their original value. So the sort of difference between, the difference between these uh, two fitted statistics gives you the um, expected value. Uh, this is actually the uh, expected first difference um, for uh, a, a uh, for uh, um, the change in X uh, over the entire data set. Now, there are a couple of things or several things you can do with this. One thing is you can plot these partial derivatives or these first differences against some other variable of interest in the data set to detect interactions. So you can plot the partial derivative or the expected first difference um, for some particular variable um, against the value of another variable in order and sort of figure out what happens. Um, you can also plot it against itself to see sort of if there's a nonlinearity or quadratic relationship or whatever uh, with X. Another thing you can do is take this distribution of partial derivatives or distribution of first differences and um, do a histogram of that. Uh, a histogram of those uh, derivatives or differences gives you a sense of the variation in the relationship between y hat and x in the data set. If there's very little variation, it should all be concentrated on this, around a single value. If there's a lot of variation, you might see a wide histogram or a bimodal histogram. Uh, so let's um, skip over to R and uh, get, a, uh, uh, get, a, uh, get some examples of how we can actually do this in real data set. All right, so uh, the first example uh, comes from uh, an APSR article from 2003 by Harf. Uh, this is an example that's in the Heinmuller and Hazlett replication data set. Uh, and it's examining the relationship between uh, uh, onset of genocide and various uh, predictive factors. Uh, the predictive factors that we're going to be most interested in here are, let's see, here we go. Uh, political upheaval, which is a continuous measurement developed by the author um, of exactly what it sounds like, sort of political upheaval. Uh, the magnitude of, magnitude of previous internal wars and regime crises summed over the previous 15 years. Uh, and prior genocide, uh, which essentially is, has a prior genocide occurred or not. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to um, replicate uh, the author's model uh, and then extend it using QRLS. Uh, so I'm going to load all these various packages that I need, including a receiver operator curve and the boot package to do some bootstrapping. Uh, and the HARF data uh, come as part of the replication uh, data file that Hazlett and Heimuller have provided. And uh, this argument right here uh, fits the KRLS uh, uh, estimator to the data. So if you type question KRLS, you'll see you get um, a function that relates x, which is an n by d numeric matrix containing the value of d predictor variables, and y, an n by 1 data, ma uh, data numeric matrix or vector that contains the values of the response variable for all the, uh, for all the observations. Um, it's going to automatically compute uh, lambda. Uh, by default, this, this parameter is chosen by minimizing the sum of squared errors. Uh, you'll also note here there's a there's a parameter for sigma. So sigma it controls the um, the bandwidth or the uh, the degree of spread in the 
Gaussian kernel weight. Now we didn't talk much about that in, in has so far in this uh, video. That was a major factor um, in the uh, in the computation of Natarajah Watson and other forms of kernel regression because there that bandwidth really determined um, how observations were sort of averaged together. Uh, in this case, most of that work is being done by uh, by lambda, the degree of of penalty. Um, uh, attached to the, uh, the, 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 the sum of squares uh, that forms the heart of the Carroll S estimator. Uh, and so um, by default, you can see here in the package, uh, bandwidth is set at the number of dimensions uh, um, uh, in the data set. Um, so in other words, the number of independent variables, uh, uh, linearly independent, independent variables, I suppose. And uh, that's that's a choice of convenience. It's not computed to be optimal in any way. And Heimuller and Hazlett report that in most cases it gives a, an acceptable sort of a result. Uh, you can, in the package, change it if you want. Um, you can see that there are some other options here, whether pointwise partial derivatives should be, uh, should be computed. Uh, also, whether first differences instead of pointwise partial derivatives should be computed for binary predictors. The package should uh, and does automatically um, predict or automatically detect when a variable is binary uh, and, and, and does first difference calculations rather than derivative calculations in that case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit the KRLS model, which happens, takes just a second, and store that in a, uh, an object called out. If I do a summary, if I expand this up, you can see, uh, what I get is uh, a report about the average marginal effects that Carol S finds. So these are the averaged uh, partial derivatives uh, that we discussed earlier. Uh, so for a prior upheaval, the average marginal effect is 0 0.002. Now prior upheaval is a variable that's on a scale from 0 to roughly 40. And like I said, it's this author's uh, coding. So um, you can interpret the scale of the estimate sort of relative to that scale of the, of the, um, uh, of the author's variable. Uh, this is prior genocide right here, and you can see that uh, it has a coefficient. This is a 1-0 variable about whether a, a genocide uh, has occurred uh, previously in the country that's being studied. Uh, and the coefficient is 0 0.2. So we're um, given that the uh, gen onset variable... is a 0, 1 variable. You can see it right there. Um, this essentially says that there's a roughly 20% chance, 20% uh, greater chance of a genocide onset uh, 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 in the case where there has previously been a genocide uh, in the country. Um, so just to, I, I don't think I mentioned this before, the, the data set is being stored in, in this object called D that was loaded into the data file when we loaded up this, um, this data set. And if you look at uh, the, well, let's see. This is what the data actually look like. It's essentially um, country level data um, for, what is it, about 100 and some countries? 126 uh, countries in the data set with some characteristics about them. And what we're seeing here is that prior upheaval is, according to the KRLS estimator, not really a substantial um, impact on the probability of genocide onset. Um, prior genocide is. You can see it's highly statistically significant and the, and the effect is sort of substantively meaningful. Compare that to the uh, OLS findings of the original study. Here are the OLS findings of the original study where you see prior people has a, sub, a, a sub substantively larger and a statistically significant uh, relationship. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, let's take a closer look at what Carolus is telling us. So this is uh, depicting the pointwise marginal effects. So this is the these are the these are the uh, derivatives that we uh, talked about earlier. And uh, what you can see here is uh, the prior upheaval estimated coefficients are really nicely concentrated and very tightly concentrated around zero. Now. These scales may be a little misleading. All these variables are on the same scale. Prior upheaval is on a somewhat maybe a different scale. If we expanded this scale, maybe things would look a little better. But that just sort of reinforces our idea that this is not a 
asymmetrically distributed or a bimodally distributed variable. This is not a zero with two modes or something uh, where the average is in between. Um, this, is a, this is a true zero uh, case. And this is further reinforced if we plot uh, the um, marginal effect for every single point. Each one of these dots is a point in the space. Um, the prior people score is, is indicated by the x-axis. <coughs> the marginal effect that KRLS computes for that point is located on the y-axis. The dotted line here is the OLS estimate of the marginal impact. It's constant, right, because it's a, it's a line. So it's constant across the entire space. Uh, the solid line here is the KRLS estimate, uh, estimate. And what you're seeing here is zero. <laughs> there's, there's nothing here. Uh, what if we wanted to um, plot standard errors around this um, KRLS estimate? Well, we, we could do so. Um, we could do so with bootstrapping. So uh, going back to a, an earlier lecture, why don't we create a bootstrap function that, um, uh, a non-parametric bootstrap function that computes the KRLS estimator for um, multiple um, samples with replacement of the original data set, uh, computes this solid line for each one of them, does it a hundred or a thousand times or something, stores them, and then we plot the uh, 2.5th and 97.5th percentile uh, of those uh, of those va of those bootstrap values. So what you can see I'm doing here is I'm in this argument right here. I'm bootstrapping this function. So you can see the data goes in in the first argument. Index is just the bootstrapping index that goes in the second argument. For each one of these things, it subsamples the data, creates a d.boot sort of bootstrap data set, computes the KRLS estimator just as we did before, creates this lowest line predicting um, the marginal effect against the upheaval score for each one, uh, and then just reports that back. And it's going to do this 100 times. Uh, and um, what I'm doing in the boot function here is saving t. t are the actual sort of out values. This is the, these are the marginal effect um, lowest estimates, <coughs> excuse me, that I'm getting out of each one of these bootstrap replicates. And what I want to do, and you can see I'm doing it in these two arguments, is I want to save the 97.5th and 2.5th uh, quantiles of these bootstrap replicates to get, to get myself a nice looking function here. So I'm just going to repeat, I'm, or I'm sorry, I'm just going to plot the same plot. This is the same plot I had before. I've expanded the margins a little bit. Uh, and this is the 2.5th and 97.5th um, confidence intervals around this bootstrap confidence intervals around this marginal effects function. Uh, interestingly, what you can see is actually the OLS estimate is included uh, in, in a lot of these uh, for most of the length of the upheaval score. That might be an artifact of the, of the fact that I only did 100 bootstrap replicates. Let's see if, what happens if I do 1,000. The reason I did 100 is because I didn't want it to take a long time, but we have the time, so I'll just plot this again while I'm talking about it. At some point, the new plot will pop up here. But anyway, what, what I want to show you here is um, there's definitely, you can see both in the confidence intervals and in the KRLS S, estimate, there's su substantial nonlinearity here. It seems like the prior upheaval score um, for middling values has a sort of possibly slightly positive um, effect on genocide onset, um, but for most of its dimension, we're looking at a pretty solid zero. <laughs> there's, there's, doesn't seem to be going, going, anything going on here. Uh, and while we cannot reject for most of the, for most of the dimension, we can't reject, um, the, the OLS estimate. Um, it's, it's not near the center of the confidence interval, right? So this hopefully, possibly, hopefully, uh, is a case where the, uh, the linearity imposed by OLS regression has sort of forced a slightly more positive result and, and, and a slightly and a statistically significant result that when you relax the assumption of linearity isn't really there. Well, I can see my bootstrapping thousand iterations is taking longer than I thought. So I'm gonna pause the video and then go back to it or start the video up again once the bootstrapping is finished. Okay, the bootstrapping procedure has finished. Um, Looks like actually the answers didn't change that much. Um, looks like we're basically still getting this wide confidence intervals, very wide, sort of down here where the data is pretty sparse. Uh, 
um, but nothing terribly different in terms of inferences. Uh, let's look at um, the same plot for the effect of prior genocide on genocide onset. In this case, um, prior genocide is a binary variable, and so a marginal effects plot like this one doesn't make sense because plotting the, the sort of marginal effect across the entire uh, span of genocide doesn't make sense when there are no observations between no or zero and one and yes. So what I did instead was just create a box plot um, where all of the uh, uh, derivatives, the first differences in this case, for um, observations that were no's and observations that were yeses uh, are computed. And what you can see here is uh, the marginal effect is, you know, for no's it's, you know, about 0.25. Uh, for yeses, maybe 0.15. Um, both of these values are lower than the OLS estimate of 0.28, maybe 0.275. So again, hopefully, the KRLS um, estimate is getting better answers because it's less bound uh, parametrically. Uh, if you look at the ROC, huh, deprecated matrix is a predictor. Oh well, oh, can't update replication code. Um, uh, the R, this ROC uh, curve, um, if, you, if you've learned about this as, as part of um, classification or possibly um, you know, binary dependent variable models, uh, the ROC curve the, or receiver operator curve is just a measure of the fit uh, or prediction accuracy, uh, classification accuracy is a better term, uh, of a binary dependent variable model of some kind. And so if you compare uh, a logit model's uh, classification accuracy to the... Um, uh, KRLS, um, yeah, here we go. The KRLS estimates uh, accuracy. Uh, what you can see here is that the area under the curve for the uh, for model one, which is KRLS, is higher than the area under the curve for model two, which is the logit model. And this difference is statistically significant. So. Greater areas under the receiver operator curve correspond to uh, better fit. Um, it, they correspond to essentially better discrimination between um, uh, better classification or discrimination between zeros and ones, or in this case, genocide onsets and non-genocide onsets, uh, onsets. So there's some evidence uh, based on this diagnostic that the KRLS model fits better when this, with this binary dependent variable. Um, Another example, uh, this example is uh, based on uh, Bramber et al. 2006, and let me just, um, Bramber et al. 2006 is the uh, Bramber, Clark, and Golder uh, uh, famous um, uh, political analysis article about uh, interaction terms. That's been, at least at one time, possibly still is the most cited article in political analysis. Uh, the one of the empirical examples from that paper is based on this article about the relationship between presidential coattails and legislative fragmentation. And if I just can scroll down here, um, this article was was attempting to figure out um, the effect of uh, presidential candidates, uh, I believe, on the uh, uh, on the number of parties. All right, I think the number of parties is the dependent variable. Let's see. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, electoral parties is the dependent variable. So um, what the, uh, the uh, article was trying to assess was um, the extent to which uh, the number of presidential candidates has some sort of effect, uh, uh, um, has some sort of mediating effect on the temporal, on temporally proximate presidential elections on the effective number of electoral parties. And the article finds, and you can see in, in this case that uh, for most cases, there are for, for at least for these, you know, for all these graphs, um, when uh, there's a small number of presidential uh, candidates, um, temporally proximate presidential elections have a negative impact on effective electoral parties. But when there's a larger number of presidential candidates, there's sort of a nil, a, no, a null, no. <laughs> there is no effect of temporally proximate presidential elections on the effective number of electoral parties. So what we're going to do is we're going to replicate this analysis uh, using KRLS. And I've, lo I've uh, loaded in the dot whisker um, 
uh, uh, the dot whisker package, uh, which is going to enable us to make some nice plots of some of the uh, effects that we find here. So I'm going to load in the um, the Golder data, uh, and these commands here just uh, are designed to use only the data that were included in the original um, in the original study. And uh, we're predicting the effective ENEP, the effective number of electoral parties using the covariates temporally proximate presidential elections, uh, effective number of presidential candidates. Um, this is, I believe, uh, ethnolinguistic fractionalization, I think, and the log magnitude of the district. And so if you do a summary of this, uh, what you find, you know, you're getting these sort of average marginal effects. Temporally proximate presidential elections tend to depress the number of uh, electoral parties, whatever. What we really care about is um, the marginal effects here. So uh, what these commands do is they save the average derivatives and also the variance of the average derivatives, as we talked about before, into a data frame. Uh, and uh, I can use this DW plot. This is the dot whisker plot. Um, that uh, that comes from the dot whisker package up here to uh, turn these numbers into a picture as uh, Castellic uh, and I forget who uh, in in PS recommended the coefficients don't mean much that you can sort of interpret them a little more readily if you translate the numbers into a picture and so what you're seeing here yeah temporally approximate presidential elections uh, tend to um, Depress the number of parties, it's statistically insignificant. Ethnologistic fractionalization tends to raise the, um, the effective number of electoral parties, not totally surprising. Average district magnitude also raises the number of effective uh, electoral parties, yeah, whatever. What we really want to know is, are these two things, how do these two things interact? So this is a plot, this is the same plot we made before, except instead of plotting the marginal effect of temporal proximity against temporal proximity, um, we're pr plotting it against the effective number of presidential candidates. And uh, temporal proximity is uh, a binary variable, if I recall correctly. So let's see. Head, uh, is it d.clean? Yes. No, prog no, this is not a... So d-clean proximity. Yes. Okay. This is not. No, this is not strictly a one-zero variable. Um, so there are some some actual. This is not simply a binary relationship. That's what I was checking. Uh, the marginal effect of temporal proximity is sort of mostly negative, most negative, and an intermediate number of uh, uh, presidential candidates. Uh, that's going back here. Pretty different than the story we're getting from these marginal effects plots, where it's negative for a small number of presidential candidates and, and sort of either positive or null, zero, for a large number of presidential candidates. So that's a quite different story than the one that the original paper was telling. Um, what I've done here is I've uh, bootstrapped the standard errors um, like, we, uh, like we did before. Uh, so I can put error bars uh, around this line. And you can see, um, just to save time, I'm only doing, right here, 100 bootstrap replicates. If this were a real example, I'd probably want to do something more like 1,000. Uh, again, I'm using bootstrapping because um, that's going to get me a, an estimate of the uncertainty around this line. So just as I did before, I'll, I'll pause here and wait for the bootstraps to finish, and then I'll come back once the plot is created. All right. So the plot's now created. Uh, you can see that you know, these error bars are sort of reinforcing the original uh, U-shape that's, that's in this line. So that's a, that's a pretty different story. Uh, and it suggests, possibly, that the uh, original findings from the uh, Bramber, Clark, and Golder and the Golder study, which underlies that Bramber, Clark, and Golder finding, um, might be um, an artifact of the linear structure of the model, which would be interesting. Um, I want to make uh, one last uh, note here before I wrap up. So um, there are analytical uh, standard errors um, that are derived in the Heinmuller and Hazlett paper. Uh, 
for um, both derivatives and also for the fitted values. And you can see here, when I created this dot whisker plot, uh, that, uh, that dot whisker plot used right here, the, um, the, the uh, standard error that came out of the variance of the average derivatives that's produced as a part of careless out. So you can derive those um, analytic standard errors if you want. Um, for the more complicated cases, so for the cases of, for example, these, you know, plotting marginal effects um, over space, um, it, I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at here is it easily, the package easily produces these average derivatives, and there may be a way it produces pointwise derivatives as well. I've not found how to produce the pointwise derivatives, but you can, or pointwise, the, the point, I, I have found how to produce the pointwise derivatives, not how to produce the pointwise um, variance estimates, pointwise derivative variance estimates. Um, but bootstrapping can get you what you need on, along those lines. It's a little more computationally intensive. Uh, I probably wouldn't want to do this for, uh, do bootstrapping for a data set of size 10 million. Um, but for data sets like this, um, I can easily do it and it gets me the uncertainty estimates that I need. And the good thing about bootstrapping, as we learned in a prior video, is um, it's a very versatile tool, and as long as you can compute the statistic whose uncertainty you want to assess, you should be able to apply non-parametric bootstrapping to get uncertainty estimates. So it's kind of a nice, it all kind of comes together. <laughs> all right, uh, well, uh, that's all I have for this week, uh, um, or this video, this week for my class, this video for those of you watching on YouTube. Uh, thanks again, and I'll see you next time.